When you're ready to pop the question, the last thing you want to do is second guess the ring. At BlueNile.com, you can design a one of a kind ring with the ease and convenience of shopping online. Choose your diamond and setting. When you find the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Go to BlueNile.com and use promo code LISTEN to get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. That's code LISTEN at BlueNile.com for $50 off your purchase. BlueNile.com, code LISTEN. For mamas, bonus moms, office moms, moms of moms, this Mother's Day, give back to the ones that have given us so much. 1-800-Flowers helps you celebrate all your amazing moms with handmade bouquets, sweet treats, gourmet food, and one-of-a-kind gifts. Ordered easily and delivered fresh. For a limited time, you can save up to 40% off Mother's Day bestsellers at 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. Don't wait. Order today and save up to 40% at 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. Many of us have those stubborn pounds that seem impossible to lose, no matter how good we eat or how hard we work out. My solution is Plush Care. Plush Care is a leading telehealth provider with doctors who are there for you day and night to partner with you in your weight loss journey. They can prescribe FDA-approved weight loss medications like Wagovi and Zepbound for those who qualify. Plus, they accept most insurance plans. To get started, visit plushcare.com slash weight loss. That's plushcare.com slash weight loss. Welcome to the Mighty Eights podcast with me, Johan Tasker, a military historian, Mike Peters, the podcast about the people, planes and the places of the United States 8th Army Air Force, the Mighty Eights, during World War II. In this episode, we're at Cambridge American Cemetery, which honours almost 9,000 Americans who made the ultimate sacrifice during World War II while based from the United Kingdom. We're standing in the cemetery itself on the north slope of a hill running gently down to the Maddingley Road for about three miles west of the University City of Cambridge in the east of England, about 50 miles north of London. And we're in the southwest corner of the cemetery, almost at the top of the hill. And if you look out on a clear day such as today, Mike, you can see Ely Cathedral about 14 miles away. Yeah, it's quite it's quite a spectacular site, and we stood here on on the datum site, which is the point from which the whole design was laid out. And you get a great panoramic view from here as we look with the, with the stars and stripes flying overhead, with the memorial wall to our right, and all those laser straight lines of crosses up the nine thousand that you mentioned, including the wall, uh, laid out before us in, in lush green English countryside. It really is a spectacular place. And the cemetery as we've said, honours almost 9,000 Americans who died in operations based out of the UK. And that number includes those that fought at sea and on land, as well as those who fought in the skies over Europe, including the mighty 8th Air Force. And we've a very special guest with us here today, mighty 8th historian Malcolm Osborne. Mal, Ozzy, you've been coming here for a number of years now. Yes, I first started in the late 1960s um, when we used to attend Memorial Day here when it was a lot smaller than it is now. Um, And then in 1971, uh, I began researching the 398th Bombardment Group Heavy uh, that were based at Nut Hampstead in Hertfordshire. And that started me on the the whole path of 8th Air Force research. And I've written three books on uh, three different bomb- bombardment groups, but been totally immersed in the 8th Air Force for a, a great number of years. And, and indeed the cemetery here. And the cemetery here. What happened because of my interest, um, I, I was asked back in 2011 whether I would be prepared to work here for two years as a seasonal interpretive guide whilst a lot of building work was taking place and the other guides were going to be rather busy. So I worked here for two years and they were two of the most amazing years of my life. 
because I met so many wonderful, interesting people. Not so many veterans by then, of course, because they faded away, a lot of them, but the ones that did come, absolutely incredible stories, personal stories that uh, it's very difficult to share to people. We're going to touch on some of those stories in this episode of the Mighty Eights podcast. Mike, uh, if we look around, I mean, clearly we are in England, but this cemetery has a very American feel about it. Yeah, it's got the, all the elements that you would expect to find in an ABMC site. Um, we, we've been around them all over the world, but it has a very distinctive English rural country feel, almost verging on a Commonwealth War Graves culture to it. And if you look around, you, obviously the first thing you see when you, when you walk enter the gates is the crosses, which are very different to the way we do things in, in British cemeteries, but they're laser line straight, etc. Clearly the 72 foot flagpole with the stars and stripes flying which is raised and lowered every day and the, the wall the memorial to the missing at the back and you can see the chapel and the view is the panorama from here is fantastic you know and mal was just telling me that from here you know from the dayton point it's, it's the highest point around cambridge city and we, you mentioned in your introduction you can see Ely cathedral and then beyond that the next highest point is on the russian step if you look out to the east and it's it's entirely appropriate really because you think about all those different bomb groups and fighter groups that flew from East Anglia, flying out east towards their targets in occupied Europe and into Germany, how much they would have seen here. And it's, it, I think it's this place, to me, feels like it has a, a, a soul. And, and I, I can't explain that. I can't define why, because I've been to so many. But, but this one, it does have a, a feel when you come to this place. It's very special. Mal, it's clear that um, visitors here veterans returning veterans returning families visitors british visitors it has a a a certain effect on people who visit it does indeed and when you look at the actual burial um, plots 3811 world war ii burials that lie out there when you bring next of kin or uh, visitors there there's a closure this is where the person lies who's buried when you walk across to the wall of the missing, which is the longest wall of the missing of any of our cemeteries apart from the Philippines, there's no closure. And the effect on next of kin is completely different. Because when you find their name for them on the wall of the missing and point to it, then they cry quite often. And we cry with them. Um, and what we normally do when a visitor comes to the burial plot we sand the, the headstone with sand from Omaha Beach um, and then we place two flags in front of the headstone, British and American flag, and we play taps and we stand together in honour in the memory of that person who lies buried. We will do the same on the wall of the missing. We will sand the name on the, on, and put the flags at the bottom and again play taps because it's important that we always, without fail, honour the memory of the people who who lie here and for people who might not be familiar with taps just explain what it is we know it as the last post taps the last post mike yeah i really found that interesting what mal was just saying about uh, visitors and next of kin and closure um, we tend to look at um, military cemeteries in the way that Ru- rupert brooks articulated as a corner of a foreign field that's forever england in the british case and, and here forever america and yet because this is uh, this was a, a Bolero and this is a home base where the U- U.S. crews fought from, it doesn't have that same feel to me. If, if we were in, if we stood at Omaha Beach, then yes, but this, this, it's, it symbolises that unique relationship between you know the, the the Eighth Air Force, the U.S. Army, the Coast Guard, and all the other U.S. forces that used UK as a base during the, the World War Two. This is home soil to them in a way, and, and that's why I think it's important to have this the, the two flags on the grave that uh, Mal mentioned and it, it's, it's just a very different vibe altogether I think Let's go and have a look then and walk among the graves and see what we can see You're listening to the Mighty Eights podcast with me Johan Tasker, military historian Mike Peters and very special guest Malcolm Osborne We've come to the heart of the cemetery here at Cambridge, down the hill, and we're among the graves which are arranged in a semicircular pattern, radiating outwards and down the slope. And if we turn round and look back up the slope, we can see the flagpole and the stars and stripes, very much a focal point fluttering in the wind. 
Mal, there are, there are lots of theories as to, as to why the graves are laid out in mm. this uh, radiating pattern. Some people say it's the spokes of a wheel. Other people say it's, uh, it's a theatre star with the graves facing towards the flag on centre stage or at centre stage. But the theory that I like the most is that the graves are laid out perhaps like a, like a baseball pitch with the flag on the home plate, the final base that the player must touch to score. Is there any yes. truth in any well, of these theories? No, you, can't, you won't find the truth of any of those. <laughs> They're wonderful theories. I personally subscribe to the baseball. I love the baseball, the, the baseball theory. I like to think they just curved them all round to get them to fit comfortably into this piece of land looking out across the countryside. I don't know. They're, they're interesting questions that you just asked. And they are in... Um, they're perfectly laid out, aren't they? they? And are. they would have been laid out in the days before computers. So this is no, yeah, there's this no is sort all, of laser is, laser alignment no, here, no, but they are... All, this is all done with string and, and, and plumb gauges, and, it, and there's a common trench that goes right the way round, and they're measured absolutely exact the distance between each of the, each of the headstones. And Mike, as in all cemeteries of this, uh, of this nature, the burials are not separated by rank. Officers and enlisted men laid side by side yeah jim i mean we, we tend to think about the logistics of burials and and most democracies certainly have equality in death as, as an ethos for any military cemetery and that's that's true here as well there are people here who died of venereal disease people who are killed in action people who died in road accidents etc it's, it's anybody and and that it's certainly in world war ii with the citizen armies which is certainly when you think about the u.s military <laughs> When they, when they, after Pearl Harbor, it's all about the citizens of a nation being mobilised to fight. Uh, and so there's that thing of, yeah, there's no, there's no class to this. There's no, no separation of officers and NCOs and, and other ranks. It, it's they're American. Is there any order in terms of date order? Are they, are they buried in the order in which they died, or, or how does it work? You'd like to think so, but I mean, as, as Mal was just talking about the, the first burials in the top right corner, but then when it, later on, when you start to centralise and bring people in from Brookwood and other places, there's more of a it, it's chronological, as in the, the, the order they're brought in rather than the order they die. Uh, so it, it's it's less organised than that. And Brookwood being the, um, the the American cemetery south of London, and this cemetery cambridge 50 miles north of london serving ostensibly yeah, east anglia and, and this this was purely logistics again because of the so many of our uh, bomb group and fighter group airfields were in east anglia uh, so it made absolute sense to have at least a temporary uh, cemetery here and, and that's how maddingly started in concept as a temporary place it did, and, and and later on it becomes this permanent american military cemetery that we we know and and respect today so now we're at the graveside of thomas hitchcock all the people buried here are special, but there is a special story behind this grave here. Thomas Hitchcock uh, was a pilot in World War I. He was shot down in combat and he was captured. But he managed to escape from a railway carriage whilst he was being transported to a prisoner of war camp. He never went back to flying again in World War I. He came home. He went back to America and he was also a wonderful horseman and he played polo. And he went with the American polo team in the Olympic Games. He, he then became a successful businessman uh, based in Manhattan. And he had his own private aircraft, uh, a seaplane. And he had a, his own pilot used to chauffeur him down from Long Island, where he was living, into work each day, do a day's work and then fly back. But when war broke out, although he was too old for combat, he enlisted again. Uh, and he came over to uh, England, based in London. And on one, one day, he came up to Duxford for a meeting. And whilst he was at Duxford, he saw the work that they were doing, putting a Merlin, a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, into a P-51 Mustang fighter, which was somewhat underpowered with the American engine that it had. That impressed him so much that he went back to the United States and he started rattling as many cages as he could starting with the chief of the air force he he everybody he could think of to try and influence the the provision of the rolls royce merlin engine into the mustang and he was successful and eventually the the mustang became the most powerful and the most successful fighter in world war ii but there was a problem with the early mustangs and they were a bit unstable when they were in the dive 
They couldn't make out whether it was the tail plane, which actually it was because they put a fillet in it eventually. But he decided that he would go to Boscombe Down and try one himself. He was an accomplished pilot still. So he took a Mustang up, put it into a dive, and unfortunately we'll never know what happened, but it went straight in, crashed, and he was killed. So lying here, we have an incredible man. An incredible man, Thomas Hitchcock. Uh, yes. Quite an amazing story that here in this cemetery, we do have an Olympian who, who, who lies buried here. So Mal, most of the uh, most of the gravestones here, the headstones are crosses, but every now and again there's a Star of David, such as the one in front of us here. Yes, indeed. Most of the Jewish burials, in fact all the Jewish burials, have a Star of David. And as a visitor here, if you ever see a Star of David and it has a couple of stones on it, you know that there's a Jewish person who's visited this particular headstone. This one's Peter Lehman. Now, he was with the 4th Fighter Group, a fighter pilot based at Debden. And uh, he was flying, the, uh, at that time, the Thunderbolt, um, the P-47 Thunderbolt. When he was younger, his father, you must have heard of the Lehman Brothers, the bankers. Well, he was the grandson of the, the first founder. But his father was a banker. And he asked his father if he could have flying lessons, and his father said no, it was too dangerous. But he, he had flying lessons anyway. And he became quite an accomplished pilot. And when war broke out, he enlisted. And they found he was a very good pilot, in fact. And he became a fighter pilot, fourth fighter group, the famous fourth fighter group, flying the Thunderbolt. In actual fact, there was some forgiveness because his father came over to England and actually visited him at RAF Debden, where the fourth fighter group were, were based. One day, they converted from the Thunderbolt over to the P-51 Mustang. They'd been flying them for a little while and what they took off on a low-level flying exercise, three of them, and the idea was that you would do a bit of towel chasing as you you went across the country at fairly low altitude. But the P-51 Mustang, the early P-51 Mustangs, um, had a tendency when you were flying fast at low level, if you weren't very careful, they had a tendency to flip over on their back. And as they were flying towel chasing, his aircraft suddenly flipped over on its back and just went straight in and crashed and he was killed. Another example of a, a training accident. Yes. Yeah, another, another casualty in another here. Another casualty. From not, from war, not from combat. Not from combat, yeah. no. Um, m- most of the fighter pilots that are here, of course, died on the way back, mm. on the way out, or training. Because yeah, if you, you were shot down as a fighter pilot, it was over there. You'd be buried at Omaha or, oh, or, 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 or yes. somewhere. And yes. uh, these guys would be, yes, over, over England or in the channel, washed up in the yes. channel or whatever, so they, they're, they're very much training accidents or yes. out of the combat zone yes so many of the people that lie buried here didn't die in actual combat but they died as a result of combat or it could have been a training flight some of them came back really badly shot up after a mission and crashed on landing and um, some crashed on takeoff and if you were in a b-17 or a b-24 Librota, full of fuel full bomb load and you had an engine failure on takeoff that that was goodbye and, and when we look at these here, uh, you can see 306 bomb group. The, 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 these were takeoff crashes. And um, as we come down here, there's one fighter pilot. And they, they were known as the little friends, as you know, fighter pilots. The fighters were the little friends, and they called these the, the, the bomber crews the big friends. And uh, there's a fighter pilot. And not just men, women too, buried here. Indeed. Um, <laughs> One day, we had a visitor, came and asked me, do I know where Glenn Miller's mistress is buried? And I said, oh, I can't say that Glenn Miller had a mistress. Uh, I know where Emily Harper Ray uh, lies buried. She was in charge of the American Red Cross Club at Bedford when the Glenn Miller Orchestra was based there, of course. And yes, they were very, they were very good friends. When Glenn Miller got promoted um, from captain to major... Uh, he gave Emily Harper Ray uh, his captain's bars to keep as a souvenir. Eventually, she took over the American Red Cross Club in Paris. When Roosevelt died, the position that she was in in the American Red Cross Club, she was asked if she would like to represent the American Red Cross at his funeral. So she had to fly back to America. So she went on a B-17 that had been converted for passengers... Um, to fly to Northern Ireland. 
in order to the next step to fly across the, the Atlantic to America. And this B-17 was flying over the Isle of Man and it crashed into one of the mountains on the, on the Isle of Man and they were all killed. She was brought back here to Cambridge to the cemetery and she lies buried. And the story is that uh, when they found her body in her purse as they the handbag, they found the captain's bars from Major Glenn Miller and she lies buried with them. So there was a very close tie with uh, Emily Harper Ray and, and, and Major Glenn Miller. I love that story. Ready to pop the question? The jewelers at BlueNile.com have got sparkle down to a science with beautiful lab-grown diamonds worthy of your most brilliant moments. Their lab-grown diamonds are independently graded and guaranteed identical to natural diamonds, and they're ready to ship to your door. Go to BlueNile.com and use promo code LISTEN to get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. That's code LISTEN at BlueNile.com for $50 off. BlueNile.com, code LISTEN. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. You're listening to the Mighty Eights podcast with me, Johan Tasker, and military historian Mike Peters at Cambridge American Cemetery in the east of England. And we're here with very special guest, Eights Air Force historian Malcolm Osborne. Mal, we're here at the Wall of the Missing. Leon Vance, the only name on the wall in gold. Yes, he, he was the Medal of Honour winner and the only Medal of Honour winner that he's shown on the wall. The only Medal of Honour winner that we have here is with the 489th Bombardment Group at Howsworth. And on that particular day, which was June the 5th, 1944, he missed the briefing. But he turned up afterwards when they were all gathering in their jeeps ready to go out to the B-24 Liberators. And he said, I'm going to lead the mission. And one of them said to them, are you sure, sir, because you, you weren't at the briefing? I know it all. He said, it's all right, I've, I've been put up. OK, fine. So they took off, and the idea was that they were to go inland over Calais and then come back and attack from landward side to try and make the Germans think that they were going to invade Calais rather than further down the coast at Normandy. But at the briefing, they were told, you do one pass, bombs away, straight across the channel and home. But as they approached the target the bombs in his aircraft didn't go. They hung up. So he gave the order that we're going to do a 360 and come back and go again. But he was told by one of his crew, but sir, we were told at briefing, under no circumstance were we to do that. I'm in charge. We will do it. So they came round now for the second time, and by now the the, uh, anti-aircraft gunners had, had got a good map on them, and they were hit rather hard. Suffered tremendous damage. And, uh, Vance was hit and and very badly injured in one of his feet, which eventually had to be amputated. He ordered all the crew to bail, which they did, but he heard in his earphones that the radio operator was too badly injured to bail. So very bravely, Vance decided to carry on to try and get to Kent, if he could, uh, where there was the, the emergency runway RAF Manston, but he knew he couldn't make it. And in the end, he had no option. He had to ditch he ditched the aircraft, and as soon as they hit, the top turret came down and landed on top of him and was crushing him. And the aircraft slowly started sinking. And he realised, this was it, I'm going to die. He undone all his straps, tried all he could to wriggle out, and all of a sudden, unbelievably, there was an explosion. And he was blown completely free. We don't know whether it was an oxygen bottle exploded or one of the unexploded bombs had, had gone off, but whatever... He bobbed to the top of the water and eventually he was picked up by an air sea rescue launch as the rest of the crew had, had been. And he found out that the radio operator uh, had actually bailed, that whatever he had heard wasn't correct. But he was brought ashore, hospitalised, of course, 
and uh, his wife was, was told that he was okay, and his and his and his lovely little daughter. And then they decided that they would send him back home to America after he'd been hospitalised and he'd been on crutches and he was trying to learn to walk on on crutches. And he was put on a C-54 aircraft to fly back home and he was being looked after by a nurse, Catherine Price. And she was uh, going to look after him all the way back home. Somewhere between Iceland and Newfoundland, the aircraft went missing and it's never been found. So we have Vance in gold on the wall as the Medal of Honour and Catherine Price, whose name is on the wall, is the only lady, the only woman on the whole of the Wall of the Missing. So that's quite special, isn't it? The cemetery, Mike, contains the remains of 3,811 war dead, but the Wall of the Missing includes a further 5,127 names. There are more missing here than there are buried here. Yeah, and that's endemic, really, of the, of the nature of air warfare, isn't it? And uh, we can look at this, and you can see some of them have been found, and those names, among the thousands of names, you'll see a little black and gold rosette next to a name. And that means that further downstream, after this has been erected and, and put up, that, that that body has been found and identified and given a burial. And you can see one right in front of us. This is uh, Second Lieutenant Porter Pyle of the 700th Bomb Group, uh, and he was uh, he was only accounted for in, uh, in November 2022, so very recently. And his story is interesting because the 700th Bomb Group are part of the um, Second Air Division, and they're flying B-24 Liberators. And uh, Porter Pyle is uh, is on a mission on September the 27th. He's a navigator, and they're on a mission into to bomb Kassel in Germany. And it's quite a heavy toll that's taken by the German flak defences and, and Luftwaffe fighters. Um, 25 Liberators go down that day. Uh, and several of the crew aboard Pyle's aircraft were able to bail out after the aircraft was hit, but nobody saw Pyle go out, and six of the nine crew members died. Porter Pyle's body was, was not recovered. So he was eventually listed as missing in September 1945, and that's why his name was originally on the wall. And so it goes on. The American Graves Registration Unit never give up, and they're always looking for people and tracking people down. And it's much later on that um, DNA samples are taken and they decide to cross-reference those. And in September 2022, the laboratory in Nebraska identifies uh, Porter Powell's remains, uh, but although his name is still here on the wall of the missing here in Maddingley, and that's why he's got the black rosette. And that's just a one little story. And, and you can see these rosettes, which gives you heart, really, that as each aircraft wreck is found or each... DNA samples are taken from each individual body and they can be found. What I think is quite nice is that even in, in, in the Commonwealth War Graves, for example, they would fill the name in in the past. Now the practice is to leave the name there and have a rosette and I think it's, it's a really good thing. You see the name on here and then the rosette So he was missing and now he's been found and that's quite, quite heartwarming to know, isn't it? But it is noticeable, isn't it? You look at the wall and it's bomb group after bomb group after bomb group because of the nature of aerial warfare, missing in action, killed in action. Yeah, and also yeah, lost in the Channel, lost in the Atlantic, whatever, but this is the nearest place, so it, it, it makes sense. But yeah, you're right, because the, the beautiful statues of, and the airmen were, look, were stood in front of the, the door, got the air gunner with his 50 calibre machine gun there and he's carrying his parachutes. But there is a Coast Guardsman, there's a naval guy, there's an Army infantry guy, but, but the majority are air crew, uh, whether they're lost in training accidents or in bad weather or forming up for a raid or, or they've crashed on the way back. But it's it's quite sad that the the bigger majority are on the wall to the missing and not given a, a resting place and uh, given closure. There's not... This is the nearest they're going to get to, to closure for the next of kin. You're listening to the Mighty Eighth Podcast with me, Johan Taska, and military historian Mike Peters and special guest Malcolm Osborne. Walking around the outside arc of headstones here at Cambridge American Cemetery brings us to the chapel. Mal, this is a, this, it's an impressive building. It's a Portland stone, the same stone as St Paul's Cathedral in London. It, indeed it is, yes. And uh, the, as is the wall of the missing and all the way down to here. And this is Portland stone. It's absolutely beautiful, isn't it, when seen from the outside. And there's a m- wonderful map of Europe 
uh, on, on, the other, on the outside wall on the other side. But it stands as a memorial to all those who, who sacrificed. And it says here, in grateful tribute to their sacrifice and in proud memory of their valour. And that sums it up beautifully. On the north face, there are five pillars or pylons, each inscribed with one of the years 1941 to 1945, the years during which the United States participated in World War II, Mike. Yeah, and we, and we tend to look through it at it from a British point of view from 39 onwards. And, and of course, for, for the US, it's a different, different optic. They look through at this, same as the Russians with the, the Great Patriotic War. 1941 is a big year, but it's it just... When you really sit back and, and, and study it, it, it's such a hugely impressive achievement to, from 1941, from a standing start, to generate this capability into so many Americans, so much equipment, the logistics, and to be launching air, air raids into occupied territory so quickly. It really is a magnificent achievement that the US are quite rightly proud of. And Mal's already mentioned it. If we walk round to the, the south-facing wall, there's this immense map of the United Kingdom indicating the locations of every American unit during the war. And it says on it, these and many other sites were lent by the people of the United Kingdom to the armed forces of the United States of America in order that they might prepare and support their great military assaults. Yeah, and that map... Uh, what's what's so striking about that map is it goes as far right out to the targets in, in and, and where they landed, used at bases in Russia, Bucharest, r- close to the oil fields in Romania. But when you look at it, there's the, there's the air bridge coming across from St John's across the Atlantic via Iceland into the UK, Liverpool. But then you get to East Anglia, and there's this massive spider's web of lines coming out of East Anglia into into occupied Europe of all the different raids and strikes, and also the ones. Obviously, we mustn't forget the 15th Air Force. Uh, in the Mediterranean and all the other air forces involved. But there's this huge concentration a, a, around Cambridge and it all, almost seems to emanate from the spot we're standing now as a, as a central datum point in East Anglia for or, all these thousands of aircraft and people that are involved in generating this capability, this daylight of bombing offensive into, into Europe. So let's walk then and uh, let's go into the chapel and see what we can see. So at the entrance to the memorial, the main entrance doors here, they're they're made of teak wood and they bear bronze representations of military equipment and naval vessels. And we're here for the 8th Air Force, but we mustn't forget these other forces too. No, and and they're they're quite rightly commemorated here on the the wall in the cemetery itself. But the doors are quite interesting because there's these great bronze reliefs of different pieces of equipment, iconic equipment, the Jeep, the Duck, the M4 Sherman the Liberty ship, the LST, and, and the 105 Howitzer and the 155. They're, they're all there, beautifully three-dimensional models, aircraft carriers, the whole the battleships, the whole, the whole spectrum of, of, of equipment. You know, and, and people often talk about the importance of the, the P-51 Mustang or the B-17. But, you know, can, can you, when you look at it, you think, could the war effort have been sustained by the Allies without things like the jerry can, the, the jeep, the DUKW, these things that the, the, the Americans, safe from bombing and from interdiction from any enemy force, have that huge economic engine that comes into play and is churning out B-24s and B-17s like, like as they had done cars before and refrigerators, etc. And yet they could just sustain any loss and the, and the number of people and they generate this capability and there's this huge economic horsepower which is pretty much unstoppable. As soon as America enters the war, it's just a question of time that volume of economic output that, that comes in line from 42, 43 onwards and, and just increases. And you look at these things here, you know, it's, it's, it's just amazing to think of what they produced and how much... And, and they gave it to the British, the Canadians as well. The M4 Sherman is a, is a great example uh, of what they could do. And the Luftwaffe could shoot down as many B-17s and B-24s as they like. There would be another one in its place within days or even not the next day with a crew and they, they would just keep coming. And that's, uh, this is testament to that, I think, those, those pieces of equipment. This part of the cemetery is probably perhaps the closest to the Cambridge Road. We can hear the traffic in the background, planes overhead, never far away from aircraft, even today in this part of East Anglia. Let's walk inside and see what we can find.
Wow, Mal, this is uh, probably the biggest map that I've ever yes. seen. Yes. Stretching almost from floor to yes. ceiling. Yes. 30 foot tall. The mastery of the Atlantic, the great air assault. It tells so many stories. Here you have the United States 8th Air Force combined with Royal Air Force Bomber Command. You also have the, the movement of all the Operation Bolero when they brought all the troops that had to be brought over here. You can see all the shipping that's coming across. And then you can see coming down, follow the dotted lines down, and some directly from the United States for Torch, which was the invasion of, of, of North Africa. And then you can see the uh, Sicily, and then the invasion of Italy, and of course the invasion of Normandy, D-Day, and the invasion of southern France, uh, where Churchill said we must attack the soft underbelly of, of, of Europe. So when you look here, you can also see right over on the right-hand side, Poltava, which is where they flew B-17s right the way across into Russia, into Poltava, and landed. And the idea was they wanted to be based there because then they could come down and they could attack Italy. But I'm afraid the Russians were very uncooperative. But actually what happened on the first night that they landed, or the first day they landed there, there was a German um, Heinkel 111 uh, bomber that was flying not far away and actually saw them going in. And so they started doing reconnaissance and of course then the Luftwaffe paid them a visit. The Russians made them line all the aircraft up. They wouldn't let them disperse them like they were used to. And of course when they bombed, they lost an awful lot of aircraft. And I've been told by a couple of uh, in intelligence people from the 8th Air Force that they regarded that as the beginning of what we now know as the Cold War. That's really where it started, that lack of cooperation. Um, so it's quite a remarkable map because it tells so, so many wonderful, so many stories about all the targets that were attacked and the fact that we must never forget the Battle of the Atlantic and all the losses of shipping that occurred, uh, bringing all these troops and, and all the supplies across to, uh, to Great Britain. And Mike, it's, uh, it's heartening to see that this is not just an American operation. There are RAF bomber command planes represented here as well. Yeah, it's good to see. And you've got, if you look at the key, also Canadian, it's British, United States and Canadian units are, are represented by models on the map. And it, it really gives a, a really good insight visually into the complexity and the scale of the war effort that goes on. I mean, we, we, we've talked about raids like Schweinfurt and things like that as standalone uh, enterprises. But then you look at the tail. And certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm from Merseyside and, and Burtonwood, when I was, even when I was very young, was still operating as a base, and it was the largest base the Eighth, Eighth Air Force had in the UK, where all the all the stuff that came across the Atlantic was assembled, tested, modified, and put together. And it, it's it's now a huge industrial estate, and of course they were coming in via Northern Ireland, and you get the whole picture here on this map. And as Miles just talked about, the, the, the return raids into into Russia and back, and down into North Africa, and it's all here. Also, the Fifteenth Air Force, the Ninth Air Force. Uh, it's really well portrayed in it. And when you walk through the crosses to get here, it gives context. The, the, the map on the wall here gives a, a real strategic concept. And if you know nothing about the war, you can look at this and at least go, this was a huge enterprise. I, ha I hesitate to use the word crusade in the modern <laughs> contest, but uh, at the time they viewed it as a, as a crusade and um, are rightly proud of what they've done. And what I find really most interesting is all of these different campaigns and things are going on, all these multitude of units and different types. But if you look at East Anglia, the cemetery of Mattingly is marked there next to the Cambridge on the map. And then there's this semicircle with multiple spokes denoting all the different raids and angles of attack that the different air forces took, as Mal mentioned, Bomber Command, including Canadians as well, emanating right the way through into deep into Germany and beyond. And then looking down, you've got a similar spoke coming out of Foggia, the airfields around there in Brindisi, going north from Italy into Austria and southern Germany and Munich and Stuttgart targets. It's the whole European theatre of operation. Yeah, yeah, it's impressive. There were 40 bombardment groups, United States, 8th Air Force, 40 bombardment groups, 15 fighter groups. The whole of England, East Anglia, 
was turned into a vast aircraft carrier with Royal Air Force Bomber Command, with all the, bombardment, the, all, all the bomber groups that we had, all the bomber squadrons. When you look at a map and, and see the number of air, airfields that we had, it's just amazing. E even now, I get amazed when I, when I see just how many there were. The sky was never quiet. The sky was never still. Aircraft flying over here, day and night. And those aircraft depicted in the mosaic above us on the ceiling. This is an interesting mosaic. There's over 500,000 pieces of tesserae that make up the mosaic, built by Italian craftsmen in Venice. And it was built in panels, and then the individual panels were brought over and, and then assembled when the, when the memorial was being built. And it represents all the air crews that have, on their last journey, flying to heaven, which is why they're in a lighter colour to represent that they're on their way to heaven. And they've represented just about every type of aircraft that the 8th and the 9th uh, Air Force flew throughout the campaign. It is amazing the level of detail, isn't it? You can pick out ball turrets, you know, the, yes. the undercarriage, the bomb bay doors, even tail guns. Yeah, there's B-26s, B-25s, B-17s, B-24s, all the fighters, they're all here. It's great symbolism as Mel said to them, heading towards heaven and uh, having flown their last missions. Heading towards heaven, towards the, the chapel, into thy hands, O Lord, as it says. Very, very well done. Not only the chapel, but the, the windows are special too, Mel. Yes, indeed, because each one of these has the, the state seal for what were the 48 states in 1953-54 when this was designed. But at the end, we have got... Alaska and Hawaii because they became the last, the last two states so, so they're there as well so, so these are all the state, the great seals of, the, of each of the states and then on these windows we, we have all the medals that were awarded. When you look at the top you see the Medal of Honour and then you look and you way down through the, through the Purple Heart, the Bronze Star Silver Star, all different campaign medals, they're, they're all here uh, and they're quite distinctive and it it's just all so well put together. The, the huge map on the wall, the campaign maps at the bottom, the, the, symbol, the symbolism of the ceiling and then the, the state seals, the different medals, it all tells the story really well and it's quite a fitting conclusion to your walk along the wall and through the headstones into here. It's a fitting tribute to everyone who's uh, buried here. And if we turn around and look through the door, the entrance door that we just walked through, we can again see the, the stars and stripes on the 72-foot high flagpole above the reflecting pools alongside the wall of the missing. It's a great aspect, isn't it? You're listening to the Mighty Eights podcast with me, Johan Tasker, a military historian, Mike Peters. Mike, the cemetery here at Cambridge, it's, it's maintained and looked after by the American Battle Monuments Commission. Yeah, that's right. And it's, a, it's an organisation very similar in concept to our own Commonwealth War Graves Commission. It's been going about the same amount of time. In fact, 100 years this year, it's their centenary uh, this year. And uh, they have a worldwide role maintaining uh, American military cemeteries from the Philippines to to UK, Italy. I've been to the, most people know the one at Omaha Beach. Uh, and I say similar in concept to Commonwealth War Graves Commission. If if the next of kin of the uh, for those who've been killed in action don't want their bodies repatriated locally to the US, then they'll be buried close to the uh, or within the theatre of operations and uh, that's what the ABMC does it maintains them beautifully uh, with a similar ethos to our own uh, grave commission and there's somebody here that we can find out a little bit more about the work of the ABMC from yes we're going to go and see Tracy in, in the office here who's a font of knowledge on the, on the subject and very passionate about uh, about the ABMC and what it does My name's Tracy Haylock, I'm the Cemetery Associate and I actually am from Cambridge. And Tracy, where are we now? Tell me about the building that we're in. We are in what we call today the Admin Building, um, but when the cemetery um, came about, it was actually the next of kin suite. That's where families would come and spend some time and reflection in this room. And above the fireplace on the wall, there's a portrait of uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and uh, two letters either side. Yes, that's correct. The one on the left is from Dwight, 
And the one on the right is from Her Majesty the Queen. And what do they say? It's just for grateful gratitude of, of the Americans that came over here and actually um, um, helped the Allies win World War II. And why Maddingly? Tell me why the tell me how the cemetery came to be where it is. Um, the American Battle Monuments Commission came around after World War One when the general of the armies, General Pershing, realised that the Americans who lost their lives in World War I needed fitting places of burial. So what he did is he, he talked to the US government and the American Battle Monuments Commission came about on the 4th of March 1923, so it's actually 100 years old this year, wow. this year, yeah, wow. we've actually been commemorating um, the forming of ABMC. Um, so then, if you forward to when America entered the war, Great Britain was going to be, obviously become the largest logistical base in the history of warfare, and they realised that they would need somewhere to bury their World War II dead. Um, there was going to be fatalities. So what they initially did is the services of supply, General Lee made Brookwood American Cemetery, which is our World I cemetery, a temporary cemetery for World War II. But because of the strategic bombing campaign and the losses, it was getting more and more difficult to get the casualties to Brookwood American Cemetery. So they came looking for land near the airfields, and they were approached by the family that lived at Maddingley Hall, which was the Harding family, and they offered up the land here as a temporary cemetery. Um, so during World War II, Cambridge American Cemetery was actually a temporary cemetery. By the end of the war, it was just over 5,000 Americans um, buried here, just over 3,000 at Brookwood in Surrey, and about 150 buried at Listnerbrini in Northern Ireland. What the US government did after the war, it wrote to all the families and said, would you like your loved ones buried at the permanent cemetery at Cambridge or repatriated home? Quite interestingly, with the permanent cemetery, ideas were floating around during 1944 to make Cambridge a permanent cemetery. But during the war, the Harding family, what they did is they actually sold this land and Maddingley Hall itself, to the University of Cambridge. It was after the war that the University of Cambridge gave the land um, to Crown Estate. So this is British territory. Um, it's actually not American territory. Out of the just over 9,000 Americans that all died here during World War II at the three temporary cemeteries we've got 3,811, so over 60% of them actually went home. The cemetery was closed for two years while they organised the repatriation, and then after the Americans that were staying here were buried, the site was then handed over by the American Graves Registration Company, who then gave it to the American Battle Monuments Commission, who then beautified it, as you actually see it today, it was opened um, in July 1956. And if you were choosing a location for a cemetery, you, you could hardly choose a better one. That's absolutely right. Um, obviously, when you stand at the flagpole and you look out over the flatlands of East Anglia, this is where the American air bases were all situated. Even though the ground itself was not a battleground, it became a particular special sacred place, especially to um, um, the 8th Air Force, but obviously to all those other Americans that lost their lives and are actually buried here as well. A, a point of remembrance. Absolutely a point of remembrance. The saying round the flagpole says, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. That was from the John McCrae poem from World War I. And from their failing hands, they throw the torch high to us to carry on leading the lives that we actually live today. Fewer and fewer veterans are coming back. There are fewer veterans, but the families still come back. The families do come back. It's quite surprising. Um, we do have regular... Not so much direct next of kin now, but they come over here to see their um, their great grandfathers or their or their great uncles. Sometimes in a week, we may have a family every day. 
And you also have a visitor center, which I, I guess is, is becoming more and more important in keeping the stories of those who served alive. Absolutely. It does tell the story of the men and women who actually lost their lives over here, um, helping the Allies fight um, and, and win World War II. Some of them had some amazing talents prior to actually joining the war. Some of them were gifted artists, some of them were Olympians. And as General Pershing said, and he promised the next of kin after World War I, that time would not dim the glory of their deeds. And that's a quote that lives on even today. It certainly does. Tracy Haylock, thank you. You're listening to the Mighty Eights podcast with me, Johan Tasca, a military historian, Mike Peters. The podcast about the people, planes and places of the United States 8th Army Air Force, the Mighty Eighth, during World War II. Mike, that just about brings us to the end of our visit to Cambridge American Cemetery. What a fantastic visit it's been. It has been great, hasn't it? I mean, it, it really does put everything we talk about into context, the actual human cost of, of the, uh, the bombing campaign. And it, it's actually reassuring to know that this place is here for those people. Even the missing have, a, have, have their name on a wall, so it's something tangible that people can come to and see. And the maps and everything, makes, it gives it all a historical and human context, which I think is really good and it is a very special place very special place indeed mike peters thank you very much mal osborne thank you for your insights and for your stories they've all been absolutely fantastic that's it from the mighty eighth podcast from this episode with the lawnmowers in the background keeping the place pristine and as it should be Do subscribe and listen to us wherever you get your podcasts from your favourite podcast channel. And please do, if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star review. But for now, until next time, I'm Johan Tasker. Goodbye. And I'm Mike Peters. Goodbye. Mamas, bonus moms, office moms, moms of moms. This Mother's Day, give back to the ones that have given us so much. 1-800-Flowers helps you celebrate all your amazing moms with handmade bouquets, sweet treats, gourmet food, and one-of-a-kind gifts. Ordered easily and delivered fresh. For a limited time, you can save up to 40% off Mother's Day bestsellers at 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. Don't wait. Order today and save up to 40% at 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST.